You're tearing me apart, Lewis! You can't even wait for me to sit down remote. Ah, you're such a chicken, Lewis. Cheep, 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 cheep. So how's your sex life? I think it's pretty good. Hey, everybody, guess what movie we just saw? The Disaster Artist. Oh, I was looking forward to this all year. Well, I thought we, were, we went to see Birdemic. Oh my god, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. I didn't know there was a thing there. Yeah, the, I put the Lament Configuration uh, uh, oh my god. Cube right there. Oh, domestic abuse. I'm sorry. You never hit her. I, I did not hit him. I did not. Oh, oh hi, Vega. <laughs> so, yes, we just went and oh, saw... Hi, Squirtle. Excuse me. Commander Shellock. You said Captain at first. No. Commander, because he has Commander Stripes. You said Captain. I said commander. Anyway, <laughs> Disaster Artist does not involve squirtles in, in Starfleet uniforms. Uh, if in, Just in case you have not heard of this, this is the uh, adaptation of Greg Sestero's biography about, make, about the making of The Room. Oh, man. It's exactly what I expected, yet more. Hmm. God damn, James Franco really nailed this. Just, yep. Yeah. He got he got the right facial reactions down. He, especially in the very beginning, he's very unintelligible. Yes, it's like I, half the time I was like, "What is he saying?" I know, I know, he's just doing Tommy, but yeah. But especially when he's trying to recite Shakespeare, aside from "to be or not to be," <laughs> I can't understand a god blessed thing he's saying. Oh God, it's just all I heard was Stella. Stella, which Stella. is not Shakespeare, obviously, but still. Stella. Which is going to do a nice little touch there. He's reciting Streetcar Named Desire, and then, uh, actually, no, no I, for some reason I thought Greg Sestero at the end was in Streetcar Named Desire. No, no, he was in Death of a Salesman. Never mind. Stella, Stella, you make me want to yell, Stella, Stella! Yes. From, from Simpsons. I know. <laughs> But yeah, that it, it's a good movie. I don't think we needed the thing at the very beginning where we have uh, directors and actors, you know, mentioning what an auteur Tommy Wiseau is and how amazing. Yeah, didn't really need that, but with juxtaposed like is juxtaposed with the story of why this movie is shit and how it became shit. Hmm. So yeah, maybe for that, but yeah, could have done without that. Hmm. It's, uh, uh, it's it's fairly straightforward adaptation of the book. It's of course it, as an adaptation, it's missing a lot of elements here and there. Uh, it doesn't mention Greg Sestero actually getting an acting gig in Retro Puppet Master, uh, but that's fine. It's you know it's uh, uh do, we, do we do we how do we handle spoilers for a biography? Well, for those who haven't read the book, this goes into all sorts of crap that went on on the set, from people fainting to uh, people getting. Like, pissed off at Tommy. Tommy to refusing to have a closed set for a nude scene. The butt. The butt. No one will see this movie unless I show my ass. <laughs> show my butt. <laughs> oh, God. Just just everything. Lots of asides from Seth Rogen, who I think it was a script supervisor? Yes, script supervisor Seth Rogen, who was one, also one of the people who produced this film. That's fine. It works out. Uh, let's see. That was one. Not produce the room. Produce the disaster. Disaster. Let me make that clear. Hmm. Uh, let's see. The yeah. Uh, the bit of a change. Bit of a changed ending. Not like a huge changed ending, but mostly in uh, in the book. Uh, Greg Sestero describes how he uh, the, you know once principal photography was over with, they had to shoot second unit stuff, which is you know. You know, shots like, you know, uh, sweeping shots of San Francisco, location shooting that's, you know, for minor scenes. So, like, the football tossing between Johnny and, and uh, Mark, you know, and, and they, and they, and I don't recall the exact details. I've read, I've read The Disaster Artist. Hmm. Uh, I read it as soon as it came out because, hot damn, I needed to know. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, never find out where he's from, what's his age. And how he got the money. There is a recurring thing every other chapter in The Disaster Artist, which which creates a narrative, which could be Tommy's backstory, because it makes sense about him, I think, being like, like behind the Iron Curtain. Uh, uh, like, he was in, like, a communist country during, during, during uh, the Cold War, and, like, growing up in a very, kind of a dictatorial environment and losing a bunch of his family, and then eventually moving, I think, to New Orleans. 
uh, after deciding that America, you know, he, he realized that America was the great land of opportunity and he really truly believed in the American dream. So he like decided I will be, I'll be actor in Hollywood kind of a thing. And, uh, and it, I don't, and it never says that that's his actual backstory. It's, it's pretty much speculation, but it makes sense given what we do know and what we don't know about Tommy. Yeah. Plus, I like seeing the, the whirlwind romance of Greg and Tommy. Because the first third of this movie, it's like, acts like a hot romantic comedy. Like, the two, the, the two meet. One's like the baby-faced new person. The other's this charismatic older person. And they have an adventure and they move off together to L.A. to find their fortune. And eventually their relationship, their relationship goes sour. And they break up. And then they eventually get back together. It's like a romance film. It really is. It's a romance film. And Holy Tommy shit. was indeed very possessive of Greg, I think, Inc. in the book. I can't... I, it's, been, it's been like two years since I read it, so of course I might be remembering some things wrong. Well, in this movie, he comes down as like a straight-out toxic stalker friend. Mm. Like, holy shit. Once it, Greg got a girlfriend, he's all like, what the fuck? And just uh, acting like a jealous... Yeah. This bus sucks, go away. <laughs> just, just when Amber, the uh, the bartender, and him are are talking to each other. Yeah, didn't even just getting her number and. Ugh. And uh, there's a story of Greg Sestero could have gotten a chance to be on Malcolm in the Middle. Could have been his breakout thing to be uh, to be in that because uh, they ran into uh, uh, Brian Cranston. Brian Cranston. Who and I. D- did he actually pl- was in this movie? Yeah, that was Brian Cranston. Like actually, Brian Cranston. Yeah. Because I was like, that looks like real Brian Cranston. Is that real Brian Cranston? That was real Brian Cranston. Oh, that's nice. And it was an opportunity, but it would have involved him keeping his beard because he was supposed to play like a lumberjack or something like that. Uh, but and and if you recall the room, there's a bit where t- where uh, uh, Greg Sestero shaves his beard off uh, to is to symbolize you know he's suddenly becoming evil. I'm not sure why that is but you know that's a thing uh but but yeah that's his transformation into villain in the movie and he asked tommy hey can i have an extra day with the beard on so i can just go and film this this quick bit because it might be a stepping stone for me and tommy's like no no you don't you betray me you try, uh, this stepping stone for your career this movie why you go do tv <sighs> yeah and his girlfriend was like just just what the fuck mm. really it's it's the big, like, big drama scene with him in the cast was the part with Lisa when he's naked, and he's, like, ragging on Lisa, and everyone's like, what the hell is wrong with you, man? Don't say that crap, and what the... It's 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 a big part of the book, too. There's this bit where, like, uh, this barely noticeable mole or pimple or something that was on uh, the actress who played Lisa's back, and he was absolutely obsessed and screaming about it. Because she needs to look good, this real Hollywood movie. She's and, not sexy. <laughs> yeah, and he would like insult her weight, and insult, and, and of course, Hollywood itself is already pretty detrimental and and terrible about shaming women and their bodies. Yeah. So, you know, this was not exactly doing any favors for the actress. Mm. Uh, so, and 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 on top of which, the insisting on doing the nude scene on an open set with dozens and dozens of people around. You know, nude scenes in Hollywood are supposed to be done closed because, you know, it's not exactly comfortable being naked in front of dozens of people. Oh, God, seeing James Franco with just, like, his sack. Was it, what, what, a, what was that? A, it looks like a, a small paper bag around his dick. Yeah. I think it was just a small paper bag with a little tie on it. I don't know what. A, a temporary cod piece. Yeah, I didn't want to like try to look closer to <laughs> examine if that was really a dick cod, or something. Disposable cod piece. Disposable cod piece. Cod piece. <laughs> I didn't want to like you know try to look closer to see if that was really his dick or not. Yeah. This <laughs> is. Well, that but but of course but of course you know we just had to assume that was a stunt ass. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, no. That was that was a real thing that happened, and you and you know break down on set. Uh, him constantly insulting the actress he was supposed to be having the sex scene with. And of course, this is like people are like, uh, it's down a bit. Like, you know, her vagina's down there. He's <laughs> just adamant on fucking her belly button. <laughs> oh my god. 
this this movie. Uh, the room is something else. Yeah, but I don't know. There's some parts I really love. Like, I mean, I love this film. Yeah. But there's some parts that stood out to me as really loving, like when the old lady was taught like at that table with all the other actors after she got better from passing out, hmm. and they're just asking, "Why you do this? You like live so much away and blah blah blah." And he's like, "Cause we're actors." And she said something else. The the worst day on a film set is still better than the best day anywhere else. I disagree. <laughs> but, you know, I don't live in Hollywood, so what do I know? Oh, God. Hollywood would chew you up, honey. Oh, Lord, yes. Hollywood would chew me up. I mean, look at me. <laughs> what, you want a good show about, about Hollywood? You watch BoJack Horseman. Oh, God. I recommend BoJack Horseman. It's hot that, damn. Uh, I can't wait for the fifth season. That's but anyway, this is about disaster artists. This is about artists, disaster artists. Cause... Why hasn't Tommy Wiseau appeared in BoJack Horseman? Oh my god, I want this to happen. Or at least I want like a room, a room like episode where BoJack is the Greg's to stay. <laughs> like, how, like, like helping Todd make a movie, and oh. Todd and Todd and Todd has terrible ideas for a movie, something like that. Except that wouldn't work because all of Todd's ideas were brilliant. Really, dentist clowns. It's Den- dentist clowns that are now in a forest. Yes, but zombies. now, but now, he managed to transform that into an exercise program because no one runs faster than when they're fearful of their lives, and it worked. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Look, it all works out in the end. It's Todd foolery, sweetie. Todd foolery. I just, I, I want Bojack to be the Tommy and Todd to be the Greg, and just have the whole movie just. <laughs> Oh god. Yeah, uh they 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 did do the bit where where Tommy had his behind the scenes guy filming everybody so that he could review the footage later on himself and like use it and, and not not like blackmail material but like it's one of those uh, uh Howard Hughes kind of obsessive uh I have to know what people are saying about me behind my back kind of a thing yeah. uh, and then reveals haha I know what you all been saying it's like you were spying on us. Uh this terrible Yep. Uh, one thing they didn't put it into the movie, and you know, kind of lightly, just because that that day where the actress passed out because of how hot it was, uh, that was just one of many incidents where you know the crew basically mutinied against him. And there's one scene where like Seth Rogen goes to the bank to deposit his uh, you know deposit his check, and he was like surprised, like cash out his check, and he's surprised that that actually like like it didn't bounce, <laughs> and he's like. This is a bottomless well right here. I noticed that the guy who was playing the bank teller was the, uh, if Google was a guy guy. <laughs> I keep seeing him and stuff. It's like, it's a guy, that guy's around. Uh, but uh, but yeah, there's a point in the book where basically the, the checks start bouncing, even though Tommy still he's, you know still has the money. He's still rich and everything like that. But the, the checks aren't going through and people are naturally pissed off. Cause, and, and that's when Tommy reveals, you've been saying bad things about me behind my back. And and the crew just like, who gives a crap? You owe us money. And, you know, we need, like, real craft services tables. We need water. We need to be able to, you know, not die on the movie set. Yes. It's just... Oh, my God. I don't think this was in the book. You know where director comes from? Dictator. Dictator. And he's, like, doing this because he's hanging, because his dick is hanging out. <laughs> Oh, my, another good part was like when at this. It's the same scene as the old lady saying that thing, of one of the other actors like dissecting what this film is about because nobody really knows what this film is about, and it was like Lisa is society, and Tommy is like, uh, it's autobiographical. It, yes. <laughs> Somebody, who was the Lisa in his life? I bet there was a Mark. I bet there was a, uh, 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 uh. Yeah, they didn't really do much emphasis on the, on the, uh, the friends of Lisa's. I can't remember their names. Yeah, I, I don't. Uh, I mean, the Mark, like, no, whatever. One of the friends of Lisa, uh, I can't, she was, uh, an, uh The other chick. Yeah, the, the other, movie. the other woman in the movie. I can't remember her name. There's a story about her, too. I can't remember what this, what the exact details were. But something along the lines of, she was in the running to play Lisa, uh, did not get the part, but got this part. 
and like uh, uh, and she also knew some of her stuff. Like she knew some of the some of what they would actually have to do for this kind of thing. Yeah. They left out Greg Sestero was also acting as line producer mm-hmm. on the movie because uh, because Tommy only trusted him with that role. Mm-hmm. And because line producers are basically like second only to directors in terms of like getting stuff organized, which is why you don't have the line producer also be an actor in the movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, he'd have to like pick up Tommy Wiseau from his home where he like overslept and took hours preening himself before he went on to, onto the set. And they never had the uh, psychologist story. Yeah. So if you ever wondered why in the room, uh, uh, was it Phil? I can't remember his name. Like Phil the psychologist. Yeah, something like that. You're always playing a psychologist. Uh, basically, his actor got an opportunity to work with Steven Spielberg and, and like as part of the crew. And it's freaking Steven Spielberg. It's a massive career move. And, you know, he didn't have any personal affection for Tommy Wiseau. And he said to, as I said to Tommy, look, I have this opportunity. I have to uh, do this. This is a huge thing for me. And Tommy was just like, no, you betray me. I hate you. Yo, know, yada, yada, mm-hmm. yada. And so that's why in the end of the movie, there's suddenly this random guy who's at the party who's like, who's, Tommy who's is very, very sensitive. sensitive. Yeah, that's supposed to be the psychologist. Mm. But no, it's just some random party goer who've never seen before. Yeah, like, uh, and like you told me about uh, Chris R. Yeah. Actually being the defender of the, like, of the, everyone. Yeah, because Chris R., I can't remember if he was an actor already or if he just was doing acting for this because as a side thing but he knew about some of the industry stuff and and look took a look on the set when they called him back uh because uh, because for some reason tommy decided uh no no we shot this film in alley but we have to do it on roof now makes more sense to do it on roof even though of course it doesn't make any sense to do it on the roof now like is there no security in this apartment building where tommy where, where johnny lives <laughs> Uh, uh, and of course, nothing to bring up the fact that we, instead of just filming on a roof, we film on a green screen of a roof because real Hollywood movie. Uh, but Chris R, they bring him back and he's like, you know, you've seen the movie. He's actually one of the better actors in the movie where he's, you know, very intense. Where's my fucking money, Denny? Where's my fucking money? He is very intense, very imposing. Uh, uh, so when he sees, you know, some of the terrible conditions of the set, he basically just like goes up to Tommy and says, "You're gonna frickin' fix this right now," and you don't argue with this guy because he looks because he really looks like he's gonna kill you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love uh, everyone getting together to see the film premiere. Yep, and just making fun of it. And, oh, and Tommy uh, circling the block. Uh, that was that was apparently a real thing too. <laughs> and of course, the real cringe you you get while watching this film. There was a lot of secondhand embarrassment. Of just being a viewer of a film, ah, oh, the part with the producer yeah. in the restaurant. Uh, Tommy's Tommy, in a restaurant. Yeah, but... Tommy's in a restaurant. Notices uh, some producer. I forget which producer it was. Goes up and is like trying to get a shot with him, but he's like eating. He's on a date or whatever. And it's like you have to go through my like my agency, agency or whatever. And he's like gives him his headshot and then. He loudly goes into to be or not to be blah 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 Stella and he <laughs> got security and everybody on him and yeah this was like one of his lowest points in the movie I can't remember if that was in the book or not I don't think it was but I can believe it being a real thing that happened you want to go get the book I could I'll be right back yep but yeah it there was a lot of moments in this movie that was just Oh, God, I can't believe... Oh, you know when you're watching a TV show and you just gotta look away, but you can't not look away? Just, yeah, secondhand embarrassment sort of feelings. There was a lot of that. Like, uh, but in the early scenes of the movie, Tommy in acting class... (laughs) Literally climbing the walls. Oh, wow, there's a picture. Yeah, there's uh, some pictures in the middle of it. My pla- yep, Tommy's planet. My planet will be bigger than everything. <laughs> and of course, headshot seen by every casting director in Hollywood for Greg Sestero. <laughs> Reenacting the Rebel Without a Cause knife fight at Griffith Observatory. Ah, uh, they did not bring up uh, uh, Tommy's demo reel. Oh. His street fashions commercial. Where he wanted to get, like, he needed to, to get a SAG card or something like that. He needed to actually be in something. So he filmed a commercial for, like, his own, like, brand or something like that. 
like street fashions or whatever it was called. So he so he filmed that doing the Shakespearean thing. You may you may have seen a commercial online somewhere, like in a YouTube clip. I gotta look it up after this. <laughs> and the and technically, since it's an actual credit, he was able to get like a SAG card. Wow, is that easy to get a SAG card? It might be. You just need to actually be in something. I might again. I'm quoting from memory here. He needed something, to, and he, the only way he could do that is if he had an actual credit. The lost take of the Chris R scene on, on the indoor alley set. Our first day of shooting. <laughs> oh man, just. Just Peter, Peter was his name. Kyle Volt, <laughs> Vogt, V-O-G-T, as Peter, and Greg Ellery as Peter's replacement, Stephen. Separated at birth? Probably not. <laughs> well, yeah, I was looking forward to this movie for a while, because I am a fan of how hilariously bad The Room is. I, I watched it with friends many times. I went to theater showings and threw spoons, and of course... The spoons! They didn't tell the spoon story. Uh, well... You know, it's it's definitely after the thing. They did have that little montage of, like, real footage of Tommy and Greg going to showings and how much money it made at, from being the, one of the worst films ever. Well, no, I mean, uh, the story of why... I mean, if you watch The Room, if you pay attention to the background details, there are pictures of spoons all over the apartment. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the book explains why that is. Why? Be basically, they needed to do last-minute set decorations because they realized everything was very sparse. In, in the room sets they had constructed. So, like, he just sent Greg out to get get something to to fill the space in. So he just went to a nearby, like, uh, 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 like, like furniture or glassware or silverware store or something like that, uh, that kind of a store, and he just bought the display models. And they decorated it with the display models. Spoon! <laughs> oh, I like how before the film even started, you had someone up front... Like, making sure everyone knew that this was the disaster artist and not the room. So, don't keep your spoons and footballs to yourself. <laughs> That's... Oh, wow. Once Johnny's big announcement was finally completed, we moved on to filming the debut of a new cast member, whose name was Greg Ellery, and he was playing a character Tommy, Tommy hastily named Stephen. I have a tony named Stephen, Tommy explained. <laughs> Stephen's lines were all originally intended to be spoken by Peter, Johnny's psychologist friend, but Tommy had lost Kyle Vogt, who was playing Peter. Rather than assign the rest of Peter's lines to other established characters in the film, Mike or Denny, say, Tommy created an entirely new character, which I think might, might be the most fascinating artistic decision he made while conceiving and making the room. <laughs> oh, Stephen. They brought up the fact that Denny was actually older than some of the some of the other actors in the movie, but was playing like a 15 or 16-year-old. I'm 26. <laughs> You would play your own age, like 15 or 16. I'm 26. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> oh, God. But just, oh, what Can else? I take a photo of you for continuity? You continuity in your head. Carton continuity in your forehead. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what does that mean? <laughs> and, of course, the rooftop scene. Filming, I did not hit her. I did not. <laughs> Apparently it was... I, I could have sworn in the book that he said it was like 60 takes. It was like six, around 60 in a movie, like 62, I think. Yeah, but I think I saw an interview where they were talking about making of The Disaster Artist where like uh, Greg Cicero said it was actually more like 20 or something, but I could have sworn in the book it was like 60 or something like that. Because yeah. he does talk about how, how stupidly odd it was that it was taking so long because... It's not a complicated line. It's not like there are big words or complicated words in it. It's, I mean, as you saw in the film, even the entire crew was repeating it every time Tommy said, What is line? I did not hit her. I did not hit her. It's it was a bull bullshit. I did not hit her. I, I did, did not. not. Oh, oh, hi, Mark. Mark. <laughs> and then Mark gave him a bottle. Just a bottle. That happened in the book too. Basically, that was the, the way they got it through it was he needed something to do with his hands to express himself. And lightly throwing the water bottle was apparently enough. <laughs> they also didn't mention another one of the weird choices that Tommy Wiseau made post production wise. Mm -hmm. All of Tommy Wiseau's lines in the room are dubbed. Hmm. Because, uh, to quote Tommy, I'm afraid people won't understand me. Yeah. 
I did not. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, odd choices for the movie itself included like uh, I mean, it was fun seeing the comparison of the actual of them recreating the room scenes with the with these actors and then the actual room scenes. But I don't know what purpose it actually serves by doing that. Oh. If, um, it, maybe maybe they filmed like just a bunch of scenes for the premiere, and then it's like we filmed them anyway. Might as well show them off. Oh, like uh, the move, like the disaster artist versions of the scene with the uh, original. Yeah, I thought they just put that in for fun because it, I actually find that pretty interesting. Like I love uh, just seeing. Wait, is this recording? Okay, I'm about to say I didn't see the record. And yeah, it's kind of like, it's kind of hidden in the background because we have all this colorful stuff back here. Is the mic on? The mic is on. Okay, so I was like... Da, 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 da. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. I just like seeing the... Um, the side-by-side. Side-by-side. And just looking at little differences here and there. Like, sometimes things are just a little bit off. But they look very close. As close as they could get. Hmm. And they did so many, but not all of them had a place in the film. So, might as well put them at the end. Yeah. I like that sort of stuff. I like it. It, ju- it just it seems like an odd thing. Especially because it goes on for like two or three minutes. Well, it's like... Three, four to credits hmm. after they do the uh, the end and stuff. So if I was doing that, I would put the I would have it side by side with the credits. Yeah, then people sit through the credits. Hmm. I would have. That's a good, better choice. But you wanted it big enough so people can notice the, all the details. And it was very close. They they did a very good job with that. Yes, it was like sometimes just matches up so perfectly in sync with what what they're saying and the layout. I, I'm just like. Oh. Him throwing the TV out the window. I, and you know, I love the end of this film where, you know, Greg's like, why am I even doing this? I, I'm trying to get this guy out of my life now. Mm. And he shows up to the premiere and everyone's laughing at the movie. And he's embarrassed at first, but then he's getting into the spirit of it because he realizes this is just a, it's a bad movie, but you can laugh at a bad movie. Yeah, and, and gave Tommy that pep talk like, how many people did this? You hear those people? You see those people? They're having a fun time. Uh, you know, you know, you think you think uh, uh, Alfred Hitchcock ever got a reception like that? And and Tommy buys into it because hence because of course you know he made the movie as a serious thing, but nowadays it's like oh it was dark comedy all along. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. <laughs> You're just saying that now because we all find joy and fun in it. But you know what? We do find it a dark comedy because The Room is one of those really enjoyable, wonderful bad movies. Oh God. That that comes from an honest place. Stuff like Sharknado. It's bad on purpose. It's you know fun and it's it's fun in, in that it's bad on purpose. But to have a genuine bad movie where you, they where they it, it, it tends to come from people who wanted to seriously make a good movie and then it just sucked. And actually, those are the best bad movies. Hmm. Birdemic. Birdemic. That came from so, like James Wynn's honest place trying to make a good movie and it sucked. But you know what? It sucks so bad it's good. No, it's good from a distance. It's, it's yes. It's, <laughs> it's, it's it's Although here's although although let's be fair here, sometimes those bad movies are not necessarily that enjoyable, even though yeah. they said it to be a good movie. After last season. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I can never remember how many times I've actually told this to to, to the odd to the good people out there. I first saw Birdemic. Uh Spoonie had shown it to me. After I watched his riff of After Last Season. Because After Last Season, even with the riffing, and he was good at it, it was just such a slog to get through that film. Mm -hmm. There's like a half hour sequence of just someone dicking around in Light Wave. So. I'm never watching that. (laughs) Just as well. It's, it's, It's not an easy sit. But, but then I, but then he showed me Birdemic right afterwards, and I was like, wow, Birdemic is such a much better movie. The camera moves in Birdemic. I know the characters' names in Birdemic. There's music in Birdemic. But you know what? No matter what happens, we will not make something as bad as The Room. The or thing, as maybe as popular as The Room, really. One of, <laughs> one of the things that I always like to tell people is you should, you should most definitely study bad movies, bad media. Of things because they are an object lesson of how not to do something and maybe you won't necessarily make something great by observing something bad but it's an it's a great way to help try to avoid the pitfalls and biographies like the disaster artist uh you know here's our free promotion greg sestero send me a check uh, <laughs> hashtag not sponsored by greg sestero <laughs> 
events like this, uh, you, you know, learn from these stories. Don't do what Johnny Don't does. <laughs> <laughs> don't treat your actors badly. Don't assume that director means dictator. <laughs> don't pay for a movie with your own money. That's oh, hell, a, yeah. That, that, that's something everyone in Hollywood will tell you. Producers, they exist. Mm-hmm. Uh, basically, yeah, stuff, stuff like that. It's important to take these notes, especially in creative enterprises. It's not necessarily, you know, cause, cause Tommy Wiseau still managed to achieve his dream. Everyone, every, you know, in the acting class scene later on, uh, a guy says, you know, you have a malevolent presence about you. You could be a villain, but Tommy doesn't uh, want to be a villain. He wants to play a hero. But the thing is, he's not willing to be patient. He could definitely, you know, he could, he could get hero roles later on look at, at Arnold, Arnold Schwarzenegger his career wasn't exactly great starting out as a hero nope. you know he did like Hercules in New York <laughs> but of course they dubbed over him in the original version of it but yeah. that movie is not exactly known for being a spectacular piece of cinema he got his stu he got his really big calling playing villains and then heroes and maybe the same could have happened for Tommy Wiseau if he'd been willing to give that a try yeah but he wanted to be the hero he wanted to be the tragic figure because everybody betrayed him. He fed up with this world. Lisa is the tragic figure. Lisa is society. Lisa is society. That's what we learned. They did a great job casting this as well. The actors that they chose uh, uh, you very much resembled them, or at least were able to replicate the performances of the actors and actresses they got. We saw yeah, we saw nothing of the friends with like the you know chocolate is a symbol of love. Yeah, we didn't see much of them. They. They cast it for it, but they didn't have any lines except for like. Yeah, they were in like the group shots, yeah. and they and and they yeah, like the, the lady had the lines, but that mm. weird guy who uh, forgot his underwears. <laughs> the, the the faces. <laughs> oh God! Oh why? <laughs> oh my God! I did not hit her. I did not. Oh hi, Lou. Hi, Vega. <laughs> All yeah. right, so what else is there to say about the Disaster Artist other than if you can get a chance, go see it because it's it's a it's a fun ride. Yeah, it's uh in small. It's not like oh, I stepped on a squirter. <laughs> it's like uh we saw it at the Uptown in Minneapolis, mm. and I think that's the only place in uh, Minneapolis that's, that's showing it. Yeah. There's probably maybe St. Paul has something, but when I Google searched it, it was only at the Uptown. And then like I'm so I'm guessing it's all of the. You know, more indie theaters in a major city. Like, if we were in D.C., we'd probably be seeing this at East Street Cinema. If we were in Chicago, uh, I forgot the name of it, but it's a place I went to a few times. Yeah, so basically, it, it, you know, definitely, if you can't see it in the theaters, it's worth a watch. You know, definitely buy it on DVD when it eventually comes out. Oh, you know this is going to be on Netflix in, like, a good seven, six months. Hells yeah. Anything else we should we could say about the movie? Well, but usually with movies, we talk about trailers. We did have trailers ahead of this one. Mostly, since it's you know, an independent theater, it doesn't have a lot of major stuff. We had Shape of Water, yes. a.k.a. what the how the Dark Universe should start with the creature from the Black Lagoon. I do want to see uh, Shape of Water. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, we had a, had a movie called Chill, like yep. Darkest Day or Darkest Hour, something like that. Darkest Hour. Uh, there was a movie about this uh, gay romance mm -hmm. that looked nice. Gay Summer Romance. I forgot what it's called. I feel like there was another one as well. Like another like another thing that started off as like a foreign flick, but I but like then Yeah, got that was English. the Gay Summer I, Romance. I feel I feel like there was another one besides that one. Um another gay summer romance. I don't think there were two gay summer romances. We need more of those, honey. I mean, the disaster artist was almost a gay summer romance with that first third of it. I mean, come on. You show this to anyone who doesn't know this, that people will assume, are they going out? Are they going to get together? Do, should we start shipping Greg and Tommy? And Is this shippable? We got we to gotta <laughs> see, uh, uh, what was it like? Uh, what, what, what's that movie that both Tom, Tommy Wiseau and Greg Sestero? Best Fiends best, Friends. Best Fiends Friends, that kind of thing. Yes, I want to see that. Yeah, that came out? That. No, not yet. Okay. It's coming out uh, January, I think. Ah, I'm looking forward to that. It's like They like play Assassins or something like that. I don't know. I'm looking forward to it. Reunite. Like, I love how it, even the market is like, we've reunited them. <laughs> and hey, Tommy's career really took off thanks to The Room. I highly recommend The Room Rift Tracks. Yes, that is my probably favorite way of watching The Room. Just because I really love 
<laughs> like riff tracks. Uh, my second favorite is watching the original, but with lots of people. Like in a in like there's midnight showings of this kind of like it's a Rocky Horror kind of thing. Yeah, there's a they they have like Rocky. It's like this generation's midnight showing of Rocky Horror, like how it was in the throw 90s. spoons. Oh, you so, keep you keep stepping on Squirtle's paw there. Sorry, but yeah, like uh, I I I went with a few friends back in D.C. and we threw spoons. No, wait. We wanted to get spoons at the Walgreens near the theater. They sold out of spoons because everyone bought them for the thing, so we had to throw forks and, and sporks. It's just not the same. It's not the same. Also, read the disaster artist. Check. Send it to my P.O. box. Hashtag it's, not sponsored by Greg Sestero. It's, it's a great book uh, about about Greg Sestero's life and him working in Hollywood. Uh, uh, you know, he, of course, you know, never made it big or anything like that but you know he has some interesting anecdotes from his time from his time before the room and then after it mm -hmm. and yeah it's a great time great movie uh go see it you know what i'm surprised no one tried to make a comic adaptation of the room even as just a fan comic well there is one thing uh tommy Wiseau has a canon existence in in the marvel universe explain Okay, so Carol Danvers, uh -huh. uh, like, wanted to, uh, like, it's just a one-panel joke kind of a thing, but Carol Danvers uh, is, like, complaining to a friend of hers about, I wanted to see Room by this director. You got me the Room. He started, you know, you know, starring this guy. And by the way, you're aware this guy's an alien, right? He's, ah. a, fu he's a fugitive. The, ju the, the Guardians of the Galaxy have been trying to track him down <laughs> for a while now. <laughs> oh, my God. That's the best origin story for Tommy Wiseau. I... I'm making it canon. It is canon in it's, in our universe. At least in the Marvel universe, Earth, Tommy Wiseau is officially an alien who is on the run from the Guardians of the Galaxy. <laughs> oh god! But yeah, I'm like, there's that, and just someone did make a video game of the room. Yes, uh, I actually, check out. I played that a long time ago. I played it too. What ending did you get your first time? I forgot. I got the spaceship ending. Oh. <laughs> The room video is an the room eight bit video game is amazing because it shows you uh, uh, behind you know it replays scenes from the game and you play to uh, Johnny walking around and doing your thing but it re basically shows like behind the scenes stuff that's been going on because you don't like you know see you see everything from Johnny's perspective you see you walk him to work you walk him back again you can go into Denny's room in their apartment building. Denny's room is basically like a closet yeah. with like pictures of Lisa everywhere, <laughs> and like a and, and like a like a bucket in the corner that he, that he pisses in. He like he goes to the shower and he like you see his eight bit butt. <laughs> and there are different endings to the game depending on certain choices you make and like dialogue you can say. And what and the ending that I got first time I played was the spaceship ending where it's revealed that Johnny was an alien this whole time. So I make it. It's canon in our universe. Tommy Wiseau is an alien, and we need to figure out what planet he's from. Because I don't think he's human. There's a guy who talks and acts like that. Is they, are they a human? Think about it. <laughs> Call the MIB. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, anything else to say? Um, this movie was a disaster in the best way. <laughs> See you later, guys. Bye. <laughs>